keep on rocking in the free world. Something that a lot of people can't do. And this is kind of partially the topic of these two videos for the next for this lecture uh, on social media, politics and protest from the Arab uprising to resist Trump. Now, the reason why I cover this topic is really, really straightforward. There are usually enough people per year interested in causes on social media. So at least a, a couple of people do a project on um, this kind of work. But secondly, I think to a certain extent, we're all engaged uh, with various causes on social media. So a deeper understanding of both our engagement and why social media is important important in terms of causes, I think is needed. And really the thing I want to concentrate most on in these um, two lectures, in these two videos, is that second bullet point there, social media is a site of hegemonic struggle. So this is really taken, I, I suppose, you know, as a site of hegemonic struggle, we're looking at really the work of Antonio Gramsci in terms of the, the background, but also Stuart Hall as well, when he argues about different readings of texts and you know there's a hegemonic struggle that goes on when we read texts in particular ways and I think social media is very very important in terms of this and we're certainly all familiar with political discourses on social media where two completely opposite sides have a go with each other all the time and it is at that level I think that you know this idea of a hegemonic struggle the, the, the battle for common sense ideas in popular society today this social media is a site where this occurs and so getting into this is very very important i'm going to look at a number of different things here arab spring occupy me too and resist trump i'll look at the three there occupy me too and resist trump in video two and i'll look at arab spring specifically in this one but really we're interested in here in social media as a site of political protest so again going backwards uh, to Henry Jenkins and as you know I criticised Henry Jenkins quite heavily in um, the videos on Jenkins previously and you you know you may well have had the seminars on participatory culture by this point as well and you know I'm not a massive fan um, and we know from those earlier pieces that the main characteristic of social media is their spreadable media and consumers play an active role in spreading content. Consumers this model are grassroots advocates for materials which are personally and socially meaningful for them. Now, the reason why I raise this notion of participatory culture here is because obviously political causes and arguing particular sides of a political argument kind of fits perfectly with that idea that Jenkins puts across, you know, grassroots advocates for materials which are personally and socially meaningful for them. So investing in a particular cause, I think is really, you know, a, a good example, perhaps, of what Jenkins is trying to get at with participatory culture. Um, albeit, he doesn't talk a huge amount about political-based participatory culture in his work, as I explained previously, a lot about fan study. Now, social media protests and the use of social media as a site of political protest would therefore would definitely fit with Jenkins' notion of participatory culture if that idea wasn't full of holes and deeply problematic to begin with. Indeed, politically, it's deeply problematic. We can, however, use some ideas from network theory to understand the basis for social media protest. If we think about network theory, networks allow for people with the same ideas that are distanced by space and time to cooperate and coordinate in real time because the network allows instantaneous communication. This can be done despite the inherent dangers in such communication utilizing proprietary platforms. So even if we're using something owned by Facebook like WhatsApp, there are features within WhatsApp which allow us to protect, or our, uh, means our communication is protected in particular ways. End-to-end -end decryption, for example, is used on a lot of platforms to encrypt messages, which means there's a degree and level of security to online communication through social media. Um, which perhaps doesn't exist in other forms of communication. So the network itself can facilitate protest movements and either radical or simply not mainstream political ideas online. Probably the, the example which is used most, and there are problems with the example, but the example that's used most of this in action is the Arab Spring. So cast your minds back to 2011, um, if you think in this country in 2011, with huge riots in London in 2011. Uh, much of the city was on fire for various evenings in uh, the summer of that year. Um, in other parts of the world, there were other uh, uprisings as well. So, so 2011 was a year of revolutions, major protests, riots, and the emergence of particular movements. 
Alan Bardi, who argued that in this context, 2011 was the year of the rebirth of history, a year in which people tried to change the history and the hegemony of neoliberal economics um, through political protest. And Zizek adds to Bardi's analysis that 2011 was the year of dreaming dangerously, the year in which people dared to try and make dreams of a different world a reality. Spoiler alert, it didn't really work, but it was a, a very exciting time to be, you know, it was an exciting time for me to be alive. I was still young, I still had some colour in my hair, it was a whole thing, and, you know, it was an exciting time. The new rebellious and revolutionary movements showed the world has long, uh, showed that the world has long since dreamed of something which it needs only to become conscious for it to possess in reality, to quote from Karl Marx. 2011, therefore, was a year in which dreams of a different world were actually put into political practice. And this was best embodied in the Arab Spring movement. So um, writing after the Arab Spring, Manuel Castell, so we're familiar with from the lectures on network theory, um, in his book, Networks of Outrage and Hope, analyzes the role of social media and communication power in the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions, as well as protest movements in Iceland, the Spanish 15M movement and the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, so Castell's got a broad understanding of the use of social media in 2011 in protest because he's covering a lot of different angles here. So he argued that the Arab uprisings were spontaneous processes of mobilization that emerged from calls from the internet and wireless communication networks. Castells argues directly that the, um, movements like the Arab Spring where you saw uprisings against authoritarian, authoritarian regimes in both Egypt and Tunisia and across the Arab world, they emerged from those protests from communications technologies themselves. Now, we have to be very, very careful at that point because it does sound a bit like te technological determinism that the existence of the network itself powered these things. It's not quite what Castells is arguing, but it is close to that, that, you know, as he says, the Occupy movement itself was born on the internet, diffused by the internet and maintained its presence by the internet. It was a product of the internet. But Castells wouldn't argue that it was, you know, the internet caused this. The people were vitally important as well. It's a socio-technical um, assemblage of people and technology rather than the technology did the process. So Castells puts a really strong emphasis on mobilization um, uh, capacities of the internet. His argument implies that in the studied cases, internet communications created street protests, which means that without the internet, there would have been no street process, uh, protests at all, without the ability to um, coordinate action and mobilize in large numbers, there wouldn't have been these protests emerging. It's a difficult argument because, you know, there's been a long history of protest across human, you know, across history. So to argue that it was the internet that was responsible for these ignores some of the history of protest movements itself, but definitely in terms of, you know, using Twitter, Facebook, etc. as organizing tools, these were the first major protests which emerged with them. So they were highly, at least what we can say is they definitely used social media in a very informed and in a heavy way. So the network social movements of our time are largely based on the internet, according to Castells, a necessary though not sufficient component of their collective action. The digital social networks based on the internet and wireless mobile pla on wireless platforms are decisive tools for mobilizing, for organizing, for deliberating, for coordinating, and for deciding. Castells places social media right at the core of contemporary protest. So these uh, revolutions, especially in um, in northern Africa, in Tunisia and in Egypt, they were starting to be called the Twitter and Facebook revolutions. And formulations such as the internet resulted in the emergence of movements, the movements were born on the internet, the, that protest, um, those protests were conveyed on the internet, the movements are based on the internet, as I said earlier, convey a logic that is based on a very overt form of technological determinism. You know, it's the computer done this, the internet made this happen. Well, what about the people? Uh, if you've not encountered technological determinism before, you, I mean, you should have with um, me, I guess, but the, I guess there's some people in here who wouldn't have. Um, technology is conceived in a technological determinist position. Technology is conceived as an actor that results in certain phenomena that have societal characteristics. Um, technology doesn't work that way. 
uh, it's the simple problem with technological determinism is that it gives too much agency to technology and not enough agency to human actors. Um, yes, people involved in these protests in 2011 were using technology, nobody's doubting that, but it was also people out there in Tahir Square in Cairo protesting, hundreds of thousands of them. It wasn't the internet out there. You know, it was people who were doing this. And a technologically determinist position gives too much uh, credence to the power of technology and not enough credence to the power of human actors. Castells fails to see that it's not the internet that creates sociality, but human actors who are embedded in antagonistic economic, political and ideological structures of society. Castells analysis gives no real scope to, you know, why did people get pissed off in Egypt, in Tunisia, in the Occupy movement, etc. Just says, well, the internet happened and these people get, came together. It's like, no, 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 these people were pissed before them, dude. You know, and, and yeah, okay, so these things facilitated this um, action against these regimes, but, you know, the feelings and the motivations for it are something else entirely. So, you know, we need to think about what the internet is to understand this properly. The internet is a, so, is a techno-social system, as I've called it here. You could call it socio-technical kind of the same thing, uh, consisting of social networks uh, that make use of a global network of, compu of computer networks, network upon network upon network. It's embedded in the antagonisms of contemporary society. The internet is part and embedded in contemporary society and therefore has no inbuilt effects or determinations of its own. It is part of so wider society. So collective social actions that make use of the internet can have relatively few effects or dampen or intensify existing trends. And this is the argument I'm making here, right? The antagonism towards regimes in North Africa, for example, was already there. Now, the embeddedness of the internet into those cultures in the late 2000s and early 2010s, yes, very, very important in terms of collective action, but it didn't cause any of this stuff, you know, it, you know, it, this stuff, it didn't emerge just because the internet started to exist. The actual implications of the internet depend on the context, power relations, resources, mobilization capacities, strategies and tactics, as well as the complex and, and undetermined outcomes of struggles. And this is what an analysis like Castell's kind of fails to realise. So Castell's model is too simplistic. Social media results in revolutions, rebellions, according to him. And he shares this widespread ideological talk about Twitter revolutions and Facebook rebellions that became popular when the conservative blogger Andrew Sullivan claimed the revolution would be tweeted in the context of the um, 2009 Iranian protests in Iran, obviously. Um, this is a, a sort of a pernicious idea that has emerged after Sullivan and others. It's, it's unfair just to blame and, um, Andrew Sullivan on this. But um, the idea that, you know, Twitter will play a huge role in revolutions in the future. Or Facebook, all revolutions will take place on Facebook. Revolutions take place in the street. They don't take place online. They take place in the streets. And, you know, it's a very lazy way of thinking that, you know, social media is making things happen like this way. Actually, people are making things happen. So society's reality is much more complex than Castell's behavioristic model of protest suggests. The media, social media, the internet and all other media are contradictory because we live in a contradictory society. They can help, also do not help all, at all times. And I use the sort of Coney 2012. I don't know if um, this reference might be a little bit old for you guys now, but Coney 2012, this sort of protest that emerged on Facebook against uh, the uh, warlord in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Joseph Coney, yeah, so really, really bright burning thing in 2012 that people were really up in arms about child soldiers in the DRC and all this sort of stuff. Did it change anything? But not really. It was just on Facebook. It was just a fad. It was a phase. Um, real revolution comes from mobilization of human beings and human actors in context, not just online. And that is the key thing that people who talk about Twitter revolutions and Facebook revolutions miss that, you know, actual political action involves something more than tweeting about it or Facebooking or, you know, coordinating something online. It involves actual physical action as well. So um, in analysing the Arab Spring and how contingent it was on um, social media, the Tahir Data Project conducted a survey with a number of Tahir Square activists. Tahir Square was the centre of protest in Cairo during the Arab Spring. 
Anne Wilsonson Dunn presented us data from the, that st uh, study, um, which was conducted amongst these Egyptian activists. They showed that face-to-face -face interaction was the most important form of activist protest communication, followed by television, phones, print media, text messages, then Facebook, then email, then radio, then Twitter on 13% and blogs at 12%. So the idea these were social media protests is radically mistaken. Those who were actually there and involved, face-to-face -face interaction was the key. Television and hearing television news and seeing the events broadcast on television was huge. Phones, incredibly important. And the print media, newspapers, still incredibly important. Much, all seen as far more important than social media. And it's, you know, a Western sort of ideal is being created here. You know, the tools that we've invented in the West, you know, Twitter, Facebook, great American networks of communication, a powering revolution around the world. We, we're, you know, we're, we're giving people around the world these tools and they're using them to create a better world for themselves. And it's kind of crap. Um, it is another sort of um, white hero syndrome uh, ideology going on here that, you know, these people around the world need our tools. They, we, we, they couldn't do anything unless we told them how to do it. That's nonsense. They had face to face communication. They have television. They have newspapers. That's how these were happening. So interpersonal communication, traditional media and telecommunications were much more important information sources and communication tools in the revolution than social media and the Internet. So. The idea of the like, you know, the Twitter revolution, the Facebook revolution, and how important social media is in terms of protest. Well, in actual protests that have happened and have been called that, wasn't really at all. And there is an ideology at play here that you know, white saver syndrome is alive and well. That you know, we're giving the world tools to protest against autocratic regimes. It's like, no, you're not. Uh, they're having a small role, but you're not really because. There's, there were, the tools were already there. I'm going to pick this up, uh, talk about Occupy and some other movements, including the vitally important Me Too movement uh, in the second video.